Okay. <clears throat> so, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters! Um, in the Victorian era, you could pretty much try to call on anyone, but who were you really talking to? The Ghost Club was founded in 1862 by fellows at Trinity College and included academia at Cambridge University as well. Before the 1860s, a ghost hunter was indistinguishable from the necromancer or spirit raiser, um, but the Ghost Club kind of changed all of that. The club is the oldest in existence dealing with psychic matters. It was formed with the hopes of unmasking fraudulent mediums and investigating psychic phenomena. The Ghost Club does not and has never really subscribed to any one way of thinking about the paranormal or survival after death. Um, nor does it follow any single approach to any one given subject. The club's motto is Nasci Laborare Mori Nasci. I do not speak Latin, um, which means um, be born, work, die, be born. That is not so catchy a phrase as we're ready to believe you. Um, but copywriters didn't really exist back then, so here's what we've got. Um, in truth, this theme kind of weaves itself through the group's own narrative um, as it went through many spirit in incarnations over its vast history. So I'm going to give you a spirited highlight. Um, does it work? It's going. OK. Um, so uh, spiritualism is the belief that the spirits of the dead have both the ability and the inclination to communicate with the living. In mid-19th century Britain, spiritualism polarized both science and religion with supporters and opponents in each camp. Um, it occurred amid concerns that science uh, was revealing an increasingly godless universe in which human beings were more biological machines and people kind of wanted to believe in more than that. Um, there was also a high mortality rate around that time, so the rich died, the poor died, everybody died, and everybody wished that they didn't, so they wanted to keep talking. Um, current members of the Ghost Club believe that spiritualism flourished at that point in time because for those left behind, neither science or established religion really provided them answers. Um, in 1862, the academic community was chock full of conservative institutions focused on reproducing orthodox ideas in traditional ways. Uh, but much like today, students were able to form clubs as a creative outlet for their interests. And when the Ghost Club was formed, when it was born, uh, the members surely felt like this. Uh, they were, after all, essentially the first Ghostbusters. But actually, it looked a lot more like this. <laughs> Um, at its start, the Ghost Club was more of a group of Egon Spanglers and Dana Scullies and not so many Fox Mulders, but in the very best way. Uh, little is known about the club's earliest activities. They were extremely secretive and they rarely publicized what they found. They like to talk a lot about it, but keep it secret within the club. So what records remain are pretty sparse. Uh, we do know that one of their first investigations was of the Davenport brothers, uh, conjurers who had come to London and the, they, they came in the fall of 1862 and claimed to be able to contact spirits of the dead or claimed that they had something that they wanted you to see. They would enter their spirit cabinet with their arms tied behind their backs and once the curtains were drawn and the lights were out, all sorts of spooky mayhem took place. <laughs> Uh, hands would poke out and ghostly figures would materialize away from the cabinet. The instruments would levitate and start playing themselves. And at the end of the scene, the curtains would part and reveal that the mediums just still had their hands tied behind their back, which was a super convincing trick in its time. Um, basically, they would just slip free from their ropes as soon as they were out of sight and their hands would act as things or they had stage hands who helped them. Magic. Magic. Um, the results of the Ghost Club's investigation was, again, never made public. They like to keep that pretty close to the chest. But um, they were publicly debunked um, by stage magician John Neville Maskelyne. Bless you. Uh, during its first heyday, the Ghost Club had some pretty famous members, such as Sherlock Holmes creator, the dashing and dapper Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as well as Charles Dickens, who had great expectations for paranormal investigations. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, with the death of notable members of the group, uh, namely Dickens, investigatory work uh, petered off, membership dwindled, and the club all but disappeared. Um, unlike many other Victorian fads, this one didn't die forever. It seems that the work needed to be done and had a purpose greater than the pull of their original famous members. And so after its first death, it came back stronger. It was born, reborn in 1882 simultaneously with the Society for Psychical Research, SPR, um, with whom there was an initial overlap of members. Uh, membership was considered to be eternal, extending after death with no distinction between those who were alive and those who were not, so they would um, celebrate on All Souls Day and say the names of all members, those dead or alive, to make sure that they all felt included. Um, between 1882 and 1936, the club was a private circle of 82 men. Women were not banned, but it just wasn't the thing to do for a lady. Um, after World War I, the Ghost Club began to attract younger members who would become significant in the next few years, including this guy, Nando Fedor, who was at one point Sigmund Freud's associate, and he believed that the poltergeist, poltergeist is not even a ghost, it's just a bundle of projected repressions. <laughs> um, the poet W.B. Yeats joined in 1911 and uh, Frederick Flybond joined in 1925. He worked with psychic energy in archaeology, communicating with spirits as he was doing stuff with the land and buildings and things. I know a lot about archaeology. In 1907, the Church of England um, hired him to oversee the excavation taking place at Glastonbury Abbey. And what they didn't know, that he already had this idea that the abbey was built according to principles of sacred, sacred geometry. And at night, he hosted uh, 70 seances, which he made contact with the spirit of a medieval monk named Johannes. Um, he sketched detailed plans of Glastonbury <laughs> Abbey, relayed to him by this monk, and shared them with the church. And they actually turned out to be pretty accurate. Right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, you guys. Um, Harry Price joined in 1927. He was famous for the, his investigation into the most haunted house in England, the Borley Rectory. He lived in the rectory from May 1937 to May 1938 and published his experiences in a book. His claims are now generally discredited by uh, ghost hunters. But basically, some of the research was hit or miss, confirmed, and then debunked. And at that point, with attendance in the group falling, a handful of surviving members agreed to wind up the club in 1936. Um, they had done the best that they could, but their work needed to end. But actually, no, it didn't. This, much like the spirit inspectors that they investigated, they came back. Um, in 1938, the club was reborn, resurrected by Price, who took his role of chairman um, pretty seriously. He modernized and solidified it as a group of open-minded skeptics who gathered to discuss topics. Um, he pushed for more science-based research <laughs> and strived for more controlled investigations in lab environments. He also was the first to openly allow women to the club. <laughs> But it actually like, looked a lot more like this. Um, membership was uh, kept to 500 persons. Um, he stressed that it was not, it had never been a spiritualist organization. Things were more just like a meeting of the minds and a lot of dinner parties. Um, membership did boom when he was in charge, including famous ghost hunters like fucking Peter Cushing. Which is just, of course, of course. Um, the club continued until World War II kind of curtailed its activities, and meetings ceased after Price um, kind of unexpectedly died. Um, again, the club fought back from the dead, reformed. This guy, Philip Paul, became the acting president, but after a very poorly received joke that he gave at their opening thing, he had to leave the club. <laughs> Okay, I didn't include this, but the joke was basically this woman said that her husband was much better to her alive, or much better to her dead than alive because he didn't do much alive, but now he was in her egg timer. <laughs> Did not go over well with the group. I think it's kind of funny. Um, turns out there's a lot of drama in debunking, so the position was left open for years. Um, the club continued. Okay. There we go. The club continued until World War... No? Oh, gosh. The joke. You threw me off, all of you. It's fine. Um, here we go. Is it there? Is it... It's frozen. Okay. Did it... Peter Underwood. Okay. Um, so Peter Underwood took on the role of president in 1960. He joined when uh, Price 
was still around, and um, the ghost investigator Tom Perot joined in 1967 and became chairman. Um, in 1993, the club weathered a period of internal dissension as members and their work kind of went in different directions. Some wanted to keep it more exclusive, some wanted to open it up to more things, some wanted spiritualists there, some didn't. And so amid all of the drama, uh, it is freezing. Tom Pro resigned as chairman, Underwood um, left, and he created his own group. Um, which he called the Ghost Club Society, which was very different, not the same, nowhere near anything like the Ghost Club at all. It was, it was, it was the same thing. Um, after Underwood left, Tom came back and returned to the Ghost Club as chairman, which he accepted. Um, at that point, they kind of got a makeover. They opened things up to a lot of other ideas. They investigated <laughs> extraterrestrials, dowsing, cryptozoology. It was a much more accepting group. Um, after this reorganization, you could apply for membership, um, subjected to screening by the voters. Most members live in Britain, um, and especially London, um, but other members live in the United States, and you can become a member too um, for a modest fee paid through PayPal. You don't get a cool certificate like this, but you do get newsletters and journals with all of the latest research. Um, the club still exists and functions to this day. Right now, the chairman of the club is Alan Murdy, uh, seen here with a fully functioning monocle. Right? I know. So he is also a member of SPR, and he was kind enough to chat with me about all things Ghost Club. Um, for the most part, I was interested, like, what kind of tools are you guys using? They don't use proton packs, unfortunately. Um, he told me, and he quoted uh, Tom Perot, who was a former chairman, that quite often my ghost hunting equipment is a notebook, a pencil, and a sympathetic ear. Science. Um, most of the time, we only have ghost reports to study, and I think it's important to record that accurately as much as attempting to set up the equipment in apparently haunted properties in the hopes of catching paranormal activity is exciting. It doesn't always work. Um, equipment such as cameras, videos, and tape recorders can certainly be deployed successfully in poltergeist cases since these actual physical effects can be recorded, although they are elusive. So, notebooks cameras, active listening, we've got all we need to start ghost hunting right here in this room. If you're so inclined to start tonight, Alan gave me some advice about sound recording or just hearing poltergeist, poltergeist rappings. So in the case of a normal rap, the sound, which often only lasts a few milliseconds, starts loud and then decays quickly. But if it's a poltergeist, the loudest part is near the beginning of the sound, but not quite the beginning, and then it fades. And that's what's happened in all of the 10 cases that they've studied. I can't, I'm not a poltergeist, but I can't do that one for you guys. Um, but now that you have your bis first bit of ghost busting info, you're ready to help forge the way for the next incarnation of the Ghost Club. When I asked Alan about their past, how he sees their role in the future, he had this to say. I think that the Ghost Club made a positive contribution toward the understanding of the paranormal as well as being a benefit to all its members. In particular, it also provided an open-minded and tolerant forum for discussion, encouraged researchers and work in all fields of all kinds, and maintained a connection with the ghost hunters and researchers of the past. So from the past to the present into the future, the Ghost Club's impact lives on with newer, stronger incarnations. So let's raise a glass to the skeptics and the believers, the proof and the possible, the truth is out there, if only you seek it. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to ask an important question of Lindsay. Lindsay has done all of the things to qualify for the Odd Salon Fellowship. Will you join us? I do. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 